Okay, so today we're moving on to uh, the theme of William Penn and the Quakers. And as I outlined in the last lecture, it is after the English, and remember it was only British Britain in, uh, from 1707, the Act of Union. Uh, it, was, it is after the English conquest of the Dutch colonies in North America that we can really connect the geographical area hitherto discussed to the specific English colony, later Commonwealth, of Pennsylvania. This story begins with William Penn and the dissenting group known as the Society of Friends, or more popularly, the Quakers. They and the province they forged will therefore be the focus of this lecture. As a note at this stage, however, it is important to remember that Pennsylvania was never exclusively Quaker. We've already discussed the existing Swedish, Finnish and Dutch colonists, but added to this were Germans, Africans and peoples from an array of different backgrounds, especially English and British, not forgetting, of course, the large Native American uh, presence in the region. Up until the mid-18th century, however, the Quakers were at least the preeminent political force and certainly dominated the Pennsylvania House of Assembly, which was the equivalent in America or in Pennsylvania to the British House of Commons. And the Quakers would dominate this house, I'd add, until the French and Indian War. Now, before I go into this aspect of the Commonwealth's history, there is one technical detail that we need to consider when looking at early Pennsylvanian history. In English, later British, North America, you will find three types of colony. Private or charter, royal and proprietary. Before I move on, I would like you to pause the lecture and jot down, jot down an answer to this question. What do you think were the differences between the three i.e. private, charter, royal and proprietary. What were the differences between the three different types of colony and what kind of colony was Pennsylvania? Okay, if you wish, stop the recording now and jot down an answer to this. If you haven't and if you're back, I'll now tell you the answer to that question. The royal colonies, uh, a prime example of these was New York. Uh, the royal colonies were administered by a royal governor and a council which was appointed by the British Crown. They had a representative assembly that was elected by the people, or I should say those people who had the right to vote. So you had a three-tier form of government headed by a royal governor and the council appointed by the British Crown with a representative assembly. There were proprietary colonies such as Maryland and Delaware. These were colonies which were basically uh, land grants from the British government. Individuals were awarded huge tracts of land that they would then um, supervise and govern, usually in return for political or financial favours. Um, these colonial governors, if you like, reported directly to the king. Then you had the private or charter colonies, and they included Rhode Island and Connecticut. And these were formed when the king granted a charter to a joint stock company. And the company then set up its own government independent of the crown. The king, of course, could revoke a colonial charter at any time and convert a self-governing colony into a royal colony. But what we find with British North America is that the regions, the provinces, the colonies were always really pseudo-independent. Certainly their lower houses of assembly were the true representative and governing body, even in royal colonies. And it was always said that the American colonies, including Pennsylvania, were to all intents and purposes de facto independent or had enjoyed levels of independence that belied their colonial status. Pennsylvania then, in answer to the question, was what we call a proprietary colony with a proprietorship owned by William Penn. So who was William Penn? Well, William Penn was born into a distinguished Anglican family 
and was the son of the very famous admiral, Admiral Sir William Penn. Uh, during the English Civil War of the 1640s, the senior Penn had been what was called a moderate roundhead, who had succeeded in maintaining his position at the Restoration because of his ability to adapt and compromise in the treacherous game of politics. So, William Penn's father was a distinguished man who, in addition to his own political adaptability, captured Jamaica in 1655, a crucial island in the Caribbean which allowed the English to engage even more extensively in the very lucrative sugar trade. And of course, Jamaica allowed the English to threaten Spanish interests in the Caribbean and Central American regions. Undoubtedly then, Penn was a very skilled naval commander. But he'd also helped to defeat the Dutch Navy in the Second Anglo-Dutch War of 1665 to 1667, which resulted, of course, as you might remember from the last lecture, in the British capture of New Amsterdam and their renaming of this New York. The senior Penn was also a very, very wealthy man. Charles II personally uh, would owe the senior Penn £16,000, which in turn partly explains why the region that became the colony of Pennsylvania was granted to Penn's son, but more on that later. Now, the younger William Penn didn't fo follow in his father's footsteps, even though the latter had very high hopes for him. At the age of 22, William Penn Jr. joined the Religious Society of Friends, or Qu uh, sorry, the Religious Society of Friends, or Quakers as they're called. Incidentally, the term Quaker was a term coined by the society's rivals and indeed critics and was meant to be an insult. But they turned this derogatory name upon itself and adopted the mantra themselves, which was a way of appropriating and neutralizing an, un an insult, in other words. So as this indicates, the Quakers were a persecuted sect, seemingly a threat to many. Their central um, theological notion was that of the inner light, which is God's voice in every individual. So what they believed was that all had access to salvation. Now, prior to the restoration of Charles in 1666, the country had been ruled by Oliver Cromwell's protectorate, which held distinctly Puritan Calvinistic beliefs. They were diametrically opposed to the Quaker view of the inner light because the Quakers uh, believe, uh, sorry, the Puritans believed that salvation was only open to an anointed elect, those who were predestined for heaven, in other words. And this was. Um, uh, 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 and this would result, I should say, in many years of oppression as the Quakers, of course, directly challenged this Calvinistic belief. But the Quakers held other beliefs which put them at odds with the state too. For instance, they refused to bow or take off their hats to any man, even if that man were further up the social strata. Uh, and, and it was a must, I would add, in an age of aristocracy and not yet constitutional monarchy. The Quakers refused to take up arms. They were pacifists, of course. Uh, Penn Jr. himself was a close friend of George Fox, a founder of the Quakers, uh, and, and therefore was an agitator at a very young age. When the, Briti when the restored British government began enforcing, uh, when I say British, of course, I mean um, monarchy, uh, the government of Charles II, when his restored government began enforcing religious conformity at Oxford University, Penn Jr. was expelled for praying in his dorm rather than attending the mandatory and daily Anglican chapel. Now, Admiral Penn, who had high hopes for his son, really did feel dishonoured by his son's actions, so much so that at one point he's said to have beat him with a cane, driven him out of, out of his house and had him live um, in France for several years, which I think actually is a true story of course. 
Uh, and following from this trend, uh, Penn was also in pre uh, imprisoned for his belief and was arrested on several occasions because of the path he chose to follow. Among the most famous of these was the trial following his arrest with Mil William Mead for preaching before a Quaker gathering. Penn pleaded for his right to see a copy of the charges laid against him and indeed the laws he had supposedly broken, but the judge, the Lord Mayor of London, refused this request, even though the right was guaranteed by English law. Despite heavy pressure from the Lord Mayor to convict the men, uh, the jury returned a verdict of not guilty. And the Lord Mayor then not only had Penn sent to jail again on a charge of contempt of court, but also the entire jury who had acquitted him and his fellow accused. The members of the jury, fighting their case from prison, in the end managed to win the right for all English juries to be free from the control of judges and that is a cornerstone if you like of English liberty and I would say Englishness certainly at this time. For Penn and the Quaker movement then Cromwellian and Restoration Britain was one of turmoil and suspicion. The Quakers had been considered by both the interregnum and restoration regimes as suspect because their principles differed from the state-imposed religion and because they refused to swear an oath of loyalty to Cromwell or the king. Um, Quakers obeyed the, the commandment of Christ not to swear, Matthew 5.34 as I understand it. Consequently, out of a British Quaker population of over 50,000 Quakers in the 1670s, some 1,400 were in jail for, for instance, not attending Anglican services. Others had property confiscated in lieu of fines that many could not afford to pay. So the persecution of the Quakers became so fierce that Penn, a leading figure in the sect, decided that it would be better to try to found a new free Quaker settlement in North America. Now, some Quakers had already moved to North America, New England specifically, but the Puritans there were as negative towards them as the people back home had been. And some of them had been banished to the Caribbean. Uh, the Puritans, incidentally, in New England, warned out dissenters, i.e. they often sent them away or expelled them. The Caribbean, because of its harsh climate and high mortality rates, was hardly the paradise it is sometimes considered uh, by holidaymakers today. Tropical diseases in the colonial period could wipe out settlements in the Caribbeans, and in, uh, contemporaries were very well aware of this. So, how did William Penn Jr. acquire the right to settle Pennsylvania? And indeed, in view of what you've heard so far, it does seem rather strange that in 1681, Charles II granted a Pennsylvania charter to the Quaker William Penn, one which included, it must be remembered, an enormous land grant of 29 million acres, the largest ever granted. It even included territories claimed by the Calvert family who held the proprietorship of neighbouring Maryland. They, in turn, were Catholics, whom you'd expect the Stuarts to be nice to. In addition, the Duke of York granted Penn the three lower counties that would become, or would later become, Delaware. This, as I say, was a huge land holding. So why was it granted to Penn the Quaker? Now, one reason for this surprising Stuart generosity may be that Penn was the son of Admiral Sir William Penn, who the king personally owed £16,000 to. However, 20, I, I keep going back to this, 29 million acres is a heck of a payoff, so there must have been something else. And the answer, I believe, and other historians believe, lay in the complicated religious politics 
of the latter part of Charles II's reign. Indeed, the 1670s were an incredibly troubled time in England uh, and indeed in English religious and political history. In 1678, Titus Oates and others alleged the existence of a popish plot to assassinate Charles II and bring his Catholic brother James to the throne. There followed an exclusion crisis in which Anglican and Protestant dissenters formed a Whig party that tried time and again until 1683 to legislate against the succession of the feared Catholic James. This crisis focused hostility on Catholics rather than people like the Quakers. And in response, Charles needed friends and needed to divide the growing alliance that was forming against him and his brother. And one way of achieving these ends was granting Pennsylvania to William Penn. After all, Penn had many friends in the mercantile community, which was an emerging and growing force in English politics. Two powerful factions thus would have had good reason to be grateful to the Stuarts. Now, before we talk about the settlement of the colony and, and its uh, relationship with Native Americans, early politics, etc., a little bit of anecdotal history. Uh, Penn had initially thought of calling at least part of his large grant New Wales, because Welsh migrants were a significant number of the early settlers in what would become uh, Pennsylvania. Um, then he thought about, and I think I have mentioned this to you before, thought about calling Pennsylvania, what would become Pennsylvania, Sylvania, which was Latin for forests or woods. Um, he'd, he'd changed the name because there were objections to the term New Wales. However, both of these potential names were rejected when King Charles II changed the region's name officially to Pennsylvania in honour of Penn's father, the revered William Penn. Anyway, anecdotes aside, in 1682, Penn sent 23 ships and 2,000 migrants to the colony, followed by 50 ships and 3,000 more migrants in 1683. By 1700, the colony had some 21,000 inhabitants, a startlingly quick and successful colonisation, I think it's fair to say. With mild winters and two or even three growing seasons a year, Pennsylvania suffered none of the early demographic catastrophes endured elsewhere in English, later British, North America. Penn also ensured a widely skilled settler population, advertising for industrious husbandmen and day labourers, carpenters, masons, smiths, weavers, tailors, tanners, shoemakers and shipwrights. These were the kinds of people that he wanted to move there. Penn's also granted 50 acres of land to indentured servants after their terms were finished and Pennsylvania thus became a very attractive uh, place to that group of individuals. Okay, at this point I have another question for you uh, and again if you so wish pause the lecture at this point and the question is what were indentured servants? How do we define indentured servants? If you wish, pause the lecture, jot down your answer, and I will tell you the answer in a few moments. Okay, well, here we go. Uh, indentured servants were essentially men and women who signed a contract, also known as an indenture or covenant, by which they agreed to work for a certain number of years in exchange for their transportation to America. Uh, they went to numerous colonies, starting with Virginia, the first permanent settlement in English North America, 1607, but increasingly had options elsewhere as newer provinces like Pennsylvania were established. 
Once they arrived in the New World, food, clothing and shelter were provided them in accordance with their contracts, though this didn't always go to plan and many suffered privations as a consequence. As, uh, adults sorry, usually served for four to seven years and children sometimes for much longer. Once their indentured period ended, they were granted their freedom and had property in the guise of land, clothing, seeds or other implements that would allow them to establish themselves as independent persons. Indentured servitude was a hard life and one which didn't necessarily get any easier with freedom. Nonetheless, most, most white migrants who went to North America did so as indentured servants and their service was in, essential in developing local economies. In regions like Virginia, a supplies of indentured servants dried up because of improved economic conditions in England and competition from other colonies. Local planters, supported by houses of assembly, would in time um, turn to slave labour to replace indentured servitude and indentured servants. Okay, so now I want to think about um, Native American relations in Penn's colony. And as I mentioned in a, in a previous lecture, another of the reasons why Pennsylvania quickly prospered as a colony was because William Penn placed great emphasis on forging good relations with American Indians. The Pennsylvania Charter aimed to, quote, to reduce the savage nations by gentle and just manners to the love of civil society and Christian religion. Yet, far from forcing Christianity on Native Americans or attacking and removing them, Penn formed a covenant of friendship with the Lenny Lenape, and he became known to them as Brother Mekong. In 1701, he signed a treaty with the Susquehannock that kept Pennsylvania safe during King William's and Queen Anne's wars. Uh, as I said before in a previous lecture, Native American warriors were relied on for the defence of Pennsylvania because of the Quakers' pacifism, and hence their refusal to raise armed forces of their own. So the initial period of peaceful Anglo-American relations that char characterised uh, most early English colonisations lasted far, far longer in Pennsylvania than it did, for example, in Pennsylvania. Uh, in, in Virginia, where it was somewhat shorter lived. Penn's descendants, however, were, as you'll remember, nowhere near so scrupulous. For instance, you had um, the 1737 Walking Purchase, where Penn, uh, Penn's sons employed athletes who managed to cover 64 miles in 36 hours, claiming 1,200 acres of Native American, or Lenape, I should say, land. And this would cause such bitterness that in 1755 to 1756, at the begin beginning of the French and Indian War, Indians captured or killed some 4,000 Western Pennsylvanians. Now, this is later on than what I really want to discuss today and is a feature of the 18th century, which we'll return to again. For now it is suffice to say that early Pennsylvania was rather peaceful, or was a rather peaceful place to live. Though that's not to say that there were not internal and external divisions, especially with neighbouring colonies, and, and these blighted Pennsylvania just as they did other colonies in English North America. Okay, so thinking about early Pennsylvania. Now, like, as I say, other English colonies, Pennsylvania was beset with social, economic and political rivalries, though it didn't experience the violence that often beset other provinces. First, Quakers were naturally wary of authority and more jealous than most of their rights. And the hard-working and ambitious types of settlers that Penn advertised for were never likely to sacrifice too much for the greater good of Penn's so-called holy experiment as he envisioned his tolerant but Quaker-dominated society. 
So for example, while Penn wanted to avoid what he called wilderness vacancies, thinking that ordered space would mean more orderly and happy lives, people nonetheless spread themselves about the countryside as they saw fit, creating the kind of non-contiguous settlements that could be found in nearby Virginia, neighbouring Virginia in fact. Penn also wanted to model Philadelphia, the capital city, on Turin, which Penn, Penn himself had visited and Turin of course has grid streets, piazzas, um, and, and, and in mimicking uh, Turin, Penn wanted to create in Philadelphia a green country town in which all homeowners would have a garden and small orchard and wealthier ones a country estate outside the city. Yet, however, merchants decided to congregate at the Delaware waterfront to be near trade and that created a more compact kind of settlement uh, in Philadelphia than Penn had intended. Penn also wanted freedom of conscience and inter-ethnic peace within Pennsylvania. He was remarkably successful in these, but there were tensions nonetheless. First, there were the disputes between Penn and the Calverts of Maryland, as they disputed the border between Pennsylvania and Maryland. Penn sold land in the southwest and Delaware region mainly to Welsh settlers and Marylanders responded by attacking the Welsh tract as it was called, committing murders and house burnings. Only in the middle of the 18th century did surveyors Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon draw the border between the two colonies at the 40th parallel, the famous Mason-Dixie line, and that at the time was a significant victory for the Pens over the Calverts. Further resentment arose over Penn's sale of 25,000 acres to German Pietist Daniel Pastorus in 1686, allowing him and his followers to found Germanopolis, or Germantown, which was initially quite a separate colony within a colony. As Pastorus put it, and to quote, we high Germans may maintain a separate little province and thus feel more secure from all oppression. These particular Germans would later integrate into British America, although other Germans famously didn't. The Amish, who you've likely heard of, the Amish of Pennsylvania, for example, and who arrived mostly in the 18th century, even today speak mostly German and practice a way of life, or the way of life, I should say, of their German ancestors. You might know them as Pennsylvania Dutch, but that's a bastardization of Deutsch. Even when there was integration, Pennsylvanians had conflicting feelings over their colony's heterogeneity. The French writer of the 1780s, J. Hector saint Jean de Crevecoeur, celebrated the, to quote, mixture of English, Scotch, Irish, French, Dutch, Germans and Swedes because, and again I quote, from this promiscuous the race now called Americans have risen or have arisen. Interestingly and on the other hand Benjamin Franklin saw things rather differently. Franklin of course would be a leading founding father of the American Revolution. And Franklin asked, to quote, why should Pennsylvania, founded by the English, become a colony of aliens who will shortly be so numerous as to Germanize us instead of us anglifying them? And even within the Quaker community, the English Quaker community, there were schisms. The first was the Keithian Schism, named after George Keith. He wished to reinvigorate the individualistic and egalitarian kind of Quakerism in place of the more organised, coercive regime that had been imposed by men like uh, George Fox and William Penn. Uh, Keith denounced Fox and Penn as fools, idiots, silly souls, 
hypocrites, heretics, heathens, rotten ranters, tyrants, and popes. And after publishing his Confession of Faith in 1692, he and his Christian Quaker followers left the Society of Friends and formed their own sect, though this movement fizzled out when he and many of his followers simply joined the Anglican Church. Many of Pennsylvania's early vexations, though, were political rather than religious. Many of Penn's fellow Quakers despised and eventually undermined his proprietal authority. Penn had the right under his charter to establish any form of government he pleased within the confines of English laws, and his first constitution, called the Frame of Government of the Province of Pennsylvania, reflected the contradictions between Penn's Quakerism on the one hand and his belief in hierarchy and authority on the other. The frame guaranteed religious toleration of all Christians, trial by jury, protection from arbitrary searches and sieges, a much less violent penal code than existed anywhere else in the Anglophone world, and it guaranteed a more extensive suffrage than anywhere else in the world. On the other hand, the governor and council were to formulate legislation that the assembly could then approve or reject, but not discuss or amend. He wanted, Penn wanted, as he put it, to guard against the so-called ambitions of the populace. Yet, as elsewhere in British North America, the populace, or at least some of it, made its own ambitions felt. Opponents immediately forced revisions to the frame of government, weakening executive power in 1683 by reducing the number of councillors from 72 to 18. From 1684 to 1699, Penn was forced to stay in England to explain his loyalty to James II and to defend his proprietorial rights and straighten his financial affairs. So in 1692-94, to 94, Penn actually lost the colony when royal rule was imposed but then withdrawn. In his absence, political factions formed and mobilised against him. David Lloyd led a campaign for greater legislative power, and in 1701 Penn was forced to adopt a new constitution drafted by a committee of the Council and House. The Charter of Liberties would serve as Pennsylvania's constitution until 1776, and under it, the council was excluded from the legislative process. It was reduced to advising the governor, and this created America's only unicameral, i.e. single chamber, legislature. The governor, but not the king, also via the Charter of Liberties, lost veto power over assembly legislation. The vote was given to those with 50 acres of land or 50 pounds worth of property. Also, the assembly instituted annual elections by secret ballot. Penn retained his land titles and his power to appoint governors, but his original political powers were very much circumscribed and as a consequence he even tried to sell his colony back to the crown. William Penn's death in 1718 led to a decade-long conflict between the children of Penn's first wife, Guilherme Springett, and those of his second, Hannah Callowhill, over ownership of the proprietorship. The courts would eventually rule in favour of the children of the latter, John, Richard and Thomas Penn. The final channel challenges to proprietal power came from Benjamin Franklin again, that leading light at the time of Pennsylvania politics and society, and Penn and his allies in the 1750s and 1760s led this charge against proprietal authority. authority. The Penns, however, did retain their proprietorship, 
at least until the culmination of another movement that Franklin became involved in, the aforementioned American uh, War of Independence and indeed the American Revolution. Now, legislative turmoil aside, the colony had always been a successful venture. In fact, Pennsylvania produced an economic surplus in the very first year of its existence, and agricultural productivity grew at a rate of 2 to 3 percent per annum, and that's in the first three quarters of the 18th century. That was a very, very high growth rate for a pre-industrial economy, even though the region itself produced no great staple. Without the staple producing plantations that tended to amass and concentrate wealth in, for example, the Caribbean, Pennsylvania attracted settlers and it did so on the basis of its rep reputation as, to quote, a best poor man's country. Almost three quarters of the colony's exports were grain and grain products, which were exported to Southern Europe and the West Indies. Some of the rest was livestock and meat to the islands and flaxseed to Ireland. That's Ireland as in uh, Europe Island. There was also a coastwide trade along the American seaboard. Up to 40% of Pennsylvania farmers' produce was surplus that went to market. Again, an impressive figure. Uh, these market-orientated agricultural economies were highly diverse with over a third of rural household heads in some areas involved in services other than farming. And merchants were diversified into flour milling, meat packing, and extractive and manufacturing industries in or such as wood, potash and iron. Apologies about that. Uh, also, shipbuilding and overseas and intercolonial trade led to rapid urbanization. In the middle of the 18th century, Philadelphia, the capital of Pennsylvania, overtook Boston in terms of volumes of tr trade and population size. The population of Philadelphia, which was Pennsylvania's capital, in 1760 was near 25,000. The population of New York, incidentally, was near 20,000. And by 1760, nearly one in five Pennsylvanians lived in towns. So the economic success of Pennsylvania was mirrored by its population growth. It was, by some distance, the most populous of the so-called middle colonies. And if you get the chance, and if you haven't done the British Atlantic World module, have a look yourselves at what these other middle colonies were. So the population of Pennsylvania was around 180,000 in 1760. New York, correspondingly, had a population of 120,000, New Jersey, 94,000, and Delaware, 33,000. So again, it's a very, very successful colony if defined by its population figures. But that's not the end of the expansionist story, because by the end of the 1720s, Pennsylvania settlers had also shifted westwards and colonized much of the Schuylkill and Susquehanna River basins, as well as the Delaware River Valley in the east. The following decade, uh, German settlers moved out of Pennsylvania and into the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia, some of them going even further south to the back countries of the Carolinas and Georgia. But such growth did, of course, forebode problems, as Pennsylvania settlers flooding into these backcountry regions put pressure on Native American lands. This movement also brought um, Pennsylvanians and indeed other English colonists into contact with the French who were simultaneously uh, advancing south from Canada and northwards up the Mississippi River, up, up the Mississippi River from uh, New Orleans and St. Louis, um, the Louisiana territories. And that's where we'll pick up next time when we'll look at um, Pennsylvania and the
clash of empires, namely the French and Indian later Seven Years' War. Okay, that's the end of this particular lecture. Thank you very much for listening, and as always, if you have any questions, please do let me know.